welcome to episode number 42 of the Chief Stakes and Controllers podcast presented by Fox PHL The Gambler 102.5 FM 1480 AM and iHeart Radio. I am esports and gaming insider Jason Fidelli and we got a pretty good show for you lined up this week talking about the possibility of esports betting opening up in New Jersey so I figured we would get into what you would exactly be able to be betting on. Um, going to talk about Street Fighter V has some news coming up this week, and I'm, there's something about them that uh, really intrigues me, so we're going to dig into that. And then the end of the show is going to be Easter-themed, but not in the way you expect. But before we do anything, let's get right in to the six in 60 seconds. Cloud9 White wins the first ever Valorant Game Changers tournament, not losing a single map in the entire run, and beating CLG Red in the final. Riot Games has announced that the winning mid-season Invitational Team's League of Origin will receive an extra slot at Worlds 2021. We Play Ultimate Fighting League reveals the 16 players for Soul Calibur 6 competition, including Americans Blue God, Party Wolf, and Yoki, following the Mortal Kombat 11 tournament last week won by Sonic Fox. Elsewhere, Xbox adds 16 backwards compatible games to Game Pass Ultimate's cloud gaming service, including The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, Fallout New Vegas, and Banjo-Kazooie. EA Sports announces the revival of the EA Sports Golf franchise PGA Tour, with more information coming later this year. And finally, Capcom's Monster Hunter Rise ships 4 million copies in the first weekend, moving the franchise in total to over 70 million copies shipped across every game those are your six in 60 seconds yes folks and as always the six and 60 seconds are brought to you tonight by the sponsor of cheese steaks and controllers ghost shaver ghost shaver is designed to feel like it's an extension of your arm allowing users to reach anywhere on your head face or body the precision cutting system gives you a close and smooth shave every single time thanks to its multiple rotary blades and patented handheld design Go to ghostshaver.com to get yours. Ghost Shaver, a shave above the rest. Yes, folks, those are your 6 and 60 seconds this week. Uh, really interested in that Riot Games decision, giving the winning uh, at midseason invitational teams league an extra slot. Um, I don't expect the North American LCS team to win, but to have a fourth team in Worlds would be pretty cool. Also, 4 million copies in a weekend for Monster Hunter Rise is uh out of this world that that franchise just continues to grow at insane rates with every release that comes out and i'm really interested to see where they uh go from here uh but rise is definitely succeeding so far but let's kick off with our first topic of the evening and that is that esports betting may be coming to New Jersey. It seems that a bill passed by a New Jersey Senate committee this week would add future competitions, including esports, for wagering in the states. S-2670, sponsored by Senator James Beach, passed through the Senate state government wagering, tourism, and historic preservation committee on Monday and now moves to a full assembly or Senate vote, whichever comes first. The bill must pass both before going to Governor Murphy's desk. Uh, the first a potential date for the vote will be on May the 20th. That information is from topnjcasinos.com. Thank you for the information. Interesting uh, situation we have going here. Uh, esports is growing on its own, but esports betting is its own sort of uh, niche market. Uh, a lot of people may see that as how the heck do you bet on video games, competitive video games? What could you possibly get so granular on? It's not like uh, the NBA or the NHL where you can bet on goals scored or rebounds, uh, statistics like Kill Kenny does every Monday at 5.30 on the Moonshot. You should listen to that. And I say to you that you are not researching enough because, yes, you can. You can absolutely get granular as hell in this sort of betting realm. And I am here to tell you and give you examples just how to do that. And I think the first and best example would be League of Legends. Now, League of Legends, obviously, huge eSport, probably the biggest one in the world, uh, the one that I would equate to FIFA if I had to pick, uh, if I was comparing eSports to real sports, le- not real sports, but uh, classic sports leagues. Uh, the, El- the League of Legends to FIFA comparison is pretty close, uh, and they 
actually get very in depth with the statistics that they offer at, on their website, L O L Esports, League of Legends Esports dot com. So if you go to LOL Esports dot com and you look at any game that uh, is completed from any time, they bring you to the video on demand from that um, match. They give you the, they they split them up into game one, game two, and game three, uh, or four or five, however many were in the series. And then as you watch the video on demand, or if you watch live on League uh, LOL Esports dot com, it updates the statistics that each player is earning in real time so you can see how much gold a player is earning who what hero they're playing as their kill death assist numbers how many small minions they've killed how many wards they've placed or destroyed things like that you can see how high their attack damage gets their speed gets their armor gets so there are plenty of ways that you could turn this into a sort of prop bet uh situation on esports, on something like DraftKings Sportsbooks app, let's say. So, for example, I am looking at game two of uh, a week, uh, a match from this past weekend between 100 Thieves and Dignitas. Okay, and on this page, it shows me all five players and what they have done for game two. Now, I've switched the video on demand uh, to the end, to the uh, analysts going over at the end. So that I basically I fast forwarded to see the complete number of statistics uh, for the match. And I am looking at all the different players from the team. And I'm seeing what they have done in their uh, respective roles. So the first one I'm looking at is 100 Thieves uh, Someday versus Dignitas's Fake God. They are top laners. So uh, in League of Legends, you have five uh, roles, either the top lane of the arena the middle lane of the arena or the bottom lane of the arena and then also you have support and jungler which is someone who goes in between the lanes and defeats the minions and things like that so looking back at the top laners here someday versus fake god this clip shows me uh kill death uh assist ratio so uh, someday had six kills, two deaths, and two assists to fake gods, one kill, three deaths, and three assists. Uh, someday had 322 minion kills to fake gods, 286. Fake got a 26% champion damage share to someday's 22. Uh, someday also won with the wards destroyed, wards placed, uh, and gold earned. Fake god won in kill participation. And then an attack in and, and the statistics down below, um, Someday took four of the six categories. Fake God took one, and one was a tie. No one went for lifesteal. So just from these numbers, we could say we could pick one of the laners to have more, a top laners to have more kills. In this case, Someday would have had more. We could pick one of them to have less, uh, or more or less damage share. In this case, uh, Fake God would have had more. We can do over-unders on kills or deaths or assists. We can do over-unders on gold earned. We can do over-unders on attack damage. We could do over-unders on how many categories of the six stats that are there will go to one side or the other. So if it's, say it's over-under three statistical categories that someday will have over Fake God, if you bet the over, he had uh, someday had four, so you win that bet. That sort of thing. You could do over-unders on any of these. You could do head-to-heads on any of these. And then you could get, and you could branch out into a gold leads for the entire team. By the end of the match, who had more gold uh, when the Nexus was broken and a team claimed victory? So in this case, that would have been, uh, it looks like in game two, it was uh, the blue team, who I believe is 100 Thieves in this case, took out Dignitas in game two of this. So you can look at this and see total game uh, gold, which was 72,000 for 100 Thieves and 56.9 for Dignitas. You can look at the number of kills, 20 to 7. You can look at the towers, 11 to 2. And there's so, there's so many things that, that, a, that a bookie can look at and see what can we glean from this in order to make it part of a 
uh, betting situation. There's a, there are a couple of big time creatures that appear in the jungles. You could bet on which team or which player for may, for maybe better odds is going to be the one to kill the Baron or the dragon or stuff like that. League of legends is so fertile ground for props. It's pretty insane. Handicapping it is going to be very difficult um, as the seasons go on, uh, particularly in the leagues outside of the U.S., but it is possible. It is very much possible in League of Legends to make a sound and profound betting uh, profile that players could bet on from anything from straight-up victory or defeat to more granular things like kills, deaths, assists, gold earned, Uh, towers destroyed those things like that so league of legends absolutely has a lot of potential for that the second game that has a pretty decent amount of potential in my eyes is valorant we talk about valorant a lot on this show just because it's the hottest esport that there is right now nothing bigger than valorant at the moment um valorant has not quite as many instances of being able to bet on games you can bet on uh, kills, you can bet on uh, kill-death ratio. If I'm looking at the statistics, uh, Liquipedia. Liquipedia is a great esports wiki site for um, things like League of Legends, for Valorant, for CSGO, for a bunch of things. So you could look at this and bet that by the end of the North American Stage 1 Masters Tournament, the player with the most kills throughout the entire tournament will be Baby Bay from the phase, and you'd win. You could bet that uh, 10Z would have the best kill-death ratio of the entire tournament. And you would be correct. He had a 1.44. Things like that. Uh, you could talk about kills per map. You could talk about kills, deaths, assist again. You could talk about the agents being used. You could bet on which agent would be the most used throughout the tournament. You could bet on the teams that you think will win by the time the tournament is beginning. Heck, Stage 2 Challengers is starting now or next week. And you could place a bet now on who will win the Masters tournament four weeks from now, if the betting's good. Uh, the Sentinels won the first Masters, so they would be the favorite. They beat the Phase in the finals, so the Phase would be the second favorite. Uh, and then the, of the top of the teams that made the top eight in Masters, uh, so the top eight teams in the odds, I would say, uh, you have Sentinels, you have Phase, Immortals, 100 Thieves, Luminosity, Gen G, Team Envy, and Xset. Uh, those would be your top teams, and then you could go from there. As the Challengers weeks go on, odds could change. Uh, if players are suspended, or if players are replaced, or if teams just back out, uh, like Dignitas's male Valorant team did, there are ways to do this. There are absolutely ways to to plan this and handicap this based on what's happened before. Now, Valorant now is still in a bit of a Wild West period. We're still three months away from the game itself's one-year anniversary, not even the league. Just the game itself is not even a year old yet. So there is still a lot of wiggle room that could be happening uh, as far as structure and things that are going on as far as, like, tournaments and stuff like that. I heard a lot from players that I have interviewed that the number of qualifiers versus tournaments is a little confusing and it just needs to be streamlined a little bit. So structures could change and that could change the betting portfolio. But right now, you could bet on uh kills per game you can bet on how many maps like uh right here i'm looking at the masters uh bracket from stage one and sentinels beat luminosity in the first round of the upper bracket two to one uh it was 13 points to eight points in the first map for sentinels 14 to 12 needing a tiebreaker uh for luminosity in the second map or an overtime i guess they call it and then uh the third map 13-6 13-6 to six in favor of Sentinels. Now, you could bet on final scores, like 13-8, to 13-6, to 13-2, to two, whatever it would be. You can bet on the scores at halftime. The score at half in Game 1, for example, ended 13-8, to eight, but at halftime was 8-4. to four. And then uh, Sentinels only needed five more points to win. The, in the 14-12 Luminosity match, the score at halftime was 8-4, to four, and then LG scored... The, and the second half was mirrored, 8-4 to four Luminosity, causing the 12-12 tie and going to overtime. So there are definitely, definitely possibilities here, I think, uh, for Valorant sports betting. Good Valorant sports betting. 
um, can get into the statistics a little bit more. Not quite as many statistics as League of Legends. This is like a middle ground between League and what I'm about to get into. But um, Valorant has a good possibility for betting as well. And with that, also Counter-Strike Global Offensive, since the games are so similar. Uh, Overwatch kind of fits into this um, situation a little bit. But also with Overwatch, you could talk about tank damage as a prop bet. You could talk about healing and healing damage as a, as a prop bet for the healers, the supports, um, or the tanks damage outputs you could talk about you could bet uh that carpe and rascal for the fusion will be the highest output of damage for the entire season which i would bet right now if i could but that's because i'm a fusion homer um but yeah so there's a, this is like the middle ground it's not quite as stat intensive as a league of legends or a dota 2 but it's also not as uh difficult not difficult but 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 uh it's not as barren of a betting portfolio as what I'm about to get into now, and that is fighting games, because of course I'm going to talk about fighting games. When do I ever not talk about fighting games? So what makes this interesting is in other tournaments you have, like let's take EVO 2019, for example, right? EVO 2019 uh, had a bunch of games on its slate, nine games total, and you signed up. Uh, They signed up as many as they could, and they ran that tournament with however many people signed up. The Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Tournament, had 3,300 players in it, just about. 3,300 players. That is impossible to handicap. When the brackets come out on Smash.gg, then maybe you could figure out who has the the, the easiest road or who's grouped together in pools, and then who's going to win. the. You could, you could do betting on the pools, then do betting on the top of uh, the, the, the finals of the pools, and then the second round, third round. You could do the betting inside the bracket once they come out. You don't have a lot of time because those brackets don't uh, don't come out for like four or five days before the tournament, um, and you could get into like character usage, who's what character is going to be used the most throughout the tournament, or or uh, damage outputs game to game, or who's going to win series stuff like that. But what I like as far as fighting games and the future of fighting game sports betting is the We Play Esports Ultimate Fighting League or the WUFL. Uh, which started last week with Mortal Kombat 11, is going on right now with Soul Calibur 6, that I believe next week has a Tekken 7. 16 players uh, split into two groups, Group A and Group B. Uh, every, every player in a group plays every other player in a group first to five, and then the wins, the losses, the average wins are all uh, taken. The teams are The, the tables are ranked. Uh, from 1 to 16, and then there is a bracket uh, of the playoffs where the everybody makes the playoffs, it looks like. 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so the, so the top 12 make the playoffs. Four people are left out, but the bottom, uh, not the bottom four, but the next four. So 9 through 12 are immediately slotted into the lower bracket where they have one loss and they're out, um, as opposed to the upper bracket where it's double elimination. So here, once that bracket is made, it becomes FIFA sports betting. You can bet on which uh, player you think is going to have the easiest road. You could bet on it's filling out a bracket like NCAA. You could bet game by game. You could bet through the entire tournament. You could bet uh, how many rounds as a prop bet, how many games will be won. Like, for example, uh, the finals of the upper bracket were Sonic Fox versus Tekken Master. First of all, the fact that a guy named Tekken Master is a pro in Mortal Kombat and not Tekken makes me very, very happy. I, it makes me laugh every single time. But the uh, the upper bracket final was 3-1 to one Tekken Master over Sonic Fox. I would, if I was betting that uh, match, I probably would have bet something like 3-2 to two Sonic Fox winning. But that's not what happened. I would have lost that bet. Another thing you could bet in a fighting game tournament is the idea of a bracket reset. And what that means is... In grand finals, you have at the, the the last player standing from the upper bracket and the last player standing from the lower bracket, and they do a best of seven series. They've been best of five up till now, but they do a best of seven series. If the player from the lower bracket w- beats the player from the upper bracket, gets to four wins first, the bracket is what they call reset, and then there's one more best of seven series to determine the winner. 
basically it's double elimination. The, t- the player coming from the upper bracket hasn't lost yet. So if they lose in the grand finals, the bracket resets, and we have the last showdown. Betting on whether or not there'll be a reset in the grand finals, that could be a prop bet. That's why I bring it up. So as you can see, there are plenty of different possibilities for esports betting should this um, become legal in New Jersey and hopefully in Pennsylvania. Uh, the statisticians and the number number guys, the math guys, will be looking at things like League of Legends where they can really get into some crazy uh, prop bets and parlays. Uh, Valorant and Overwatch League and, and Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike Global Offensive have a decent amount of options as far as what you can bet on. And then fighting games also do too, but they require a lot of research and a lot of time that a better may not have. But uh, if esports betting becomes legal in New Jersey, I highly recommend you at least give it a shot. And I imagine that if it does happen, someone might be able to give you a little bit of advice. Now, moving on to the second uh, segment of the night. But before we do that, I, normally I would do it on tap here, as you know. Last week I, had to, I was able to do it on tap. First time in a couple of weeks. There are two games I'd like to talk about real quick, but I'm not going to do an official on tap for them. One is Oddworld Soulstorm. Oddworld goes back. Uh, Oddworld Soulstorm goes back to the uh, format of Oddworld's Abe's Odyssey and Abe's Exodus on the PlayStation One. Great cinematic platformers. Um, this new one is getting into that format as well. Free on PlayStation Plus for the month of April. So if you have PlayStation Plus, you can download it for free, which is really cool. Highly recommend you look into that if you like some silly fun with a with a nice challenge to it. But also coming out this week is a game called Lost Worlds Beyond the Page. Lost Lost Words, excuse me, Beyond the Page. Lost Words is a puzzle platformer. uh, Very little combat, not much going on in in action or anything like that. So don't expect a lot of, like, bombast and explosions and stuff like that. Follows the story of a little nine-year-old girl uh, who receives a journal from her grandmother and starts writing in the journal. And it goes through a traumatic time for that little girl. Um... Something that uh, no little girl was really ready to deal with. Uh, Heavy, heavy, heavy topics. Uh, And you follow her journey through this, not only through her words in the journal, but also through the fantasy world that she is building um, as these things happen in real life. And you start to see the mirror between her real world and her creative world kind of coming together. Um, It's a brilliant game, and I highly recommend that you give it a try. Uh, it's on Switch, it's on Xbox, it's on PlayStation, it's on everything. Uh, please, please give it a shot. It's something different. It's only four or five hours long. It won't take you long. But uh, if you've ever lost a loved one, if you've ever felt that kind of grief, it's uh, it's a game worth playing. But uh, I didn't want to get too heavy on that, so that's my on-tap, quote-unquote, for this week. Didn't want to play the music or anything. Just a quick one. Uh, not much else coming out this week. So uh, take a look at those two. When you have the time. But let's get into our second topic of the evening, and that is Street Fighter V. Now, Street Fighter V had their spring update announced for this Tuesday, April the 6th, at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, if you followed the winter update, that was a, uh, a major update on Dan Hibiki, the first uh, the first DLC fighter of Season 5, who then released like a week later, with a little bit on Rose, who was number 2. A couple other esports related headlines, and then an Oro tease at the end, who is number three. Now, I suspect the spring update will be something similar. We'll get a big, uh, a big update on Rose, since she's number two. We'll get a little look at Oro, who is number three. We'll get a tease of Akira from Rival Schools, who is number four, and then some other esports things and some other updates that they want to give us. And then whenever the next one is the summer update. Uh, it would be just keep going and then until the season is over. But the interesting thing is they still have not revealed to us who fighter number five is. There are five fighters in the season pass. We already have Dan, Rose, Oro, and Akira, like I said. Number five is an unknown, which is strange. Normally, uh, not so much in Street Fighter V, but uh, since season three... Capcom has come right out with all the characters that were in their trailer, uh, in their games, in those season packs. Starting at Capcom twenty, a Capcom Cup twenty seventeen, the season three trailer showed everyone. Showed uh, it was Sakura, Blanca, uh, uh, G, Sagat. Uh, who were the two in the middle? Uh, Falk, and the third one I don't remember. 
ah, dang it. I, I figured, I thought I might remember. I don't remember who the third one was. Uh, but it showed every character, which was out of ca- which was out of character, because seasons one and two DLC content were silhouettes that were revealed as those characters came out, which is a, a thing that fighting games like to do. But this one, they've revealed all but one, which is weird for two reasons. One, there's a surprise to begin with, and two, the surprise has to be insane because... Akira from Rival Schools was a crazy announcement all by itself. Uh, new Rival Schools hadn't been out in years. We had, we're talking 2001 Project Justice uh, up time amount of time since Rival Schools was even mentioned. And now all of a sudden we're getting Akira in classic Street Fighter. Now there was there was a character in uh, a obscure Capcom crossover in Tatsudoka versus Capcom. Batsu was in there and uh, Kiyosuke was in Capcom versus SNK2. But oh, there's been no mainstream rival schools, and with the exception of the minor assimilation into Street Fighter, we haven't seen anything. This will be the first time we'll be able to control a rival schools character in a non-crossover game since Project Justice on the Dreamcast. So I wanted to get into a couple of my ideas for who this fifth character would be in the event that they announce it this Tuesday. I have a couple of thoughts both in Street Fighter in Capcom and out of Capcom to talk about here. And the first one is a major fan favorite, was a big time uh, favorite on the competitive season, competitive season during Street Fighter 4 and has not made the cut so far in Season 5, and that is Adon. Adon is a Muay Thai fighter from Thailand, has the big red streak of hair, uh, first debuted in Street Fighter Alpha 1 as a playable character, I believe. Um, very, very cool uh, move set with a lot of weird like diving kicks and a lot of unpredictability. He would work well in Street Fighter V, I think, but the one detriment against him is that he would not be a big surprise. Like, why hold a- a- Adon as the, till the final character unless it was supposed to be somebody else and he was your your substitute? It would just be a very weird thing to see a character as impactful as Akira be announced after Akira, or be announced before a guy like Aiden, I should say. Just be weird. Uh, so that is number one. Number two is a little more obscure, but this one comes from a Capcom franchise called Red Earth. It was a very uh, little-known arcade game uh, Capcom made where it was basically... Uh, you picked one of four or five different playable fighters and you were playing against bosses uh, instead of just regular fighting matches. It was a take on 2D fighting, but not the same as 2D fighting. And the character from that, I think, would be uh, Kenji, the ninja is his name. Um, I think he would be the best bet because he's the only, like, human in that game. You had Leo, who is a man with a lion head. You had uh, Hauser, who was a giant dinosaur, and I don't think they would do that. And then you have um, a couple other characters who would be cool in Street Fighter V, but I don't think would really fit all that well. In fact, I believe Kenji is a costume already in Street Fighter V, so that's another nod that they've been talking about, Leon, or uh, Kenji and Red Earth for the time being. Number three sticks in... Uh, Capcom's franchises, and I think it would be a nice tie-in with uh, other games that are coming out soon, and that is Chris Redfield from Resident Evil. Now, Chris Redfield, obviously, big Resident Evil character since the very first game, features heavily in Resident Evil 8 Village, uh, as we are led to believe by the trailers. That comes out on May the 7th, so putting Chris or any Resident Evil character, but I'm betting on Chris if there is one, in this game would be smart. Uh, The only problem is the fifth DLC character is scheduled to come out in the fall or winter, and Resident Evil 8 Village comes out in a month, so the times don't really match up as far as cross-promotion is concerned. So I would love the idea. I love the idea of them doing it, but I I don't know that they're going to branch franchises like that for this uh, last DLC character, which makes me now think then that... If they're going to hide this character from us until the very end, they're going to go big. And that would mean, for the first time in Street Fighter's history, 
in the core Street Fighter's history, a guest character from another franchise uh, outside of Capcom. Someone like uh, a Tekken character. Now, there was Street Fighter Cross Tekken. It was its own game, but none of those characters ever bled in to the core franchise. I'm talking about 2, 3, 4, and 5. None of them have had guest characters. This could be the first one to break that glass ceiling. And I have two uh, candidates in my head uh, that I think would be very good choices for this. The first one comes from SNK, specifically uh, Fatal Fury and the King of Fighters. He is the go-to guest character anytime SNK puts in uh, or or is invited to have a guest character. That is Terry Bogard from Fatal Fury, blonde hair, red hat, yells, okay, every time he fights. If you're playing Super Smash Bros. Ultimate with all the DLC, he was in DLC Pack 1, so you're very familiar with him. Uh, He was a guest character in Fighting EX Lair. Uh, They even, SNK is so dependent on this character, they even, in a game with all female fighting game characters, created a female version of him, also named Terry, because that name is a male or female name, and put him basically put him in the game as a girl with all of his moves. So it gave people who were big into fighting games, but were kind of turned off by this game because there wasn't really a fighter that they were into, they gave him Terry as a girl. So they really, really like putting Terry in other in other games, especially guest character games. So if Terry showed up in Street Fighter, I would not be surprised. There's a history there with Capcom versus SNK, one and two. There was a falling out between those two companies, but it seems like they have mended their bridges and the current leadership on both sides is open to the idea of working together again. Uh, if it is a SNK guest character and it leads to a third Capcom versus SNK game, you can color me a happy, happy, happy man. Uh, and then the second guest character is not in, does not come from Mortal Kombat. So I'm sorry, a lot of people are going to think that Mortal Kombat is a shoe in for a guest character just because they've been um, rivals for so long and this would be a good, you know, showing of solidarity for the uh, for the uh, fighting game community to have a Mortal Kombat character in Street Fighter. I don't think it's going to happen. Mostly also because Mortal Kombat is a Western fighting game. Street Fighter is very much an Eastern Japanese fighting game. Uh, so I'm looking to the uh, Capcom fighting game roundtables that have happened for my guest character. And there are two options here. Tekken, as I mentioned before, but they have done their thing. Uh, We're still waiting for Tekken versus Street Fighter from the uh, Bandai Namco side, in fact. So I don't think they're going to go that route. I think they're going to go a route uh, of of a company that was teased for the next fighting game roundtable. Not one that has been there yet, but one that is coming soon. I think that the the guest character could be another, uh, I'm sorry, Jackie Bryant from Virtual Fighter. Virtual Fighter is an interesting idea here because last September, Sega announced that for their 60th anniversary, a new Virtual Fighter project was in development. It was p- pitched as Virtual Fighter Cross Esports, which is weird, but it sounds like they're developing a Virtual Fighter game to be a good esport. It did show a brand new uh, model of their lead, also named Akira, uh, in that little teaser trailer. So if Sega is ramping up for a huge new Virtual Fighter game to invade our eyeballs at some point, what better way to reintroduce the franchise than to put one of your characters in Street Fighter V as the fifth guest character? Jackie Bryant is my choice. He is not the only choice. Uh, His sister Sarah Bryant would be a good choice. Uh, Pai or Lao Chan would be a good choice. Akira uh, Yuki would be a great choice, but you already have an Akira in the Rival Schools uh, character. Having two would be very confusing, so I think he's out. Uh, either of the Bruisers, Wolf Hawkfield or Jeffy McWild, basically anybody who was in the first Virtua Fighter, with the exception of Akira, uh, would be a great guest. But my choice would be Jackie Bryant. He's got a good mixture of uh, of uh, strikes and parries and a couple of throws in there. I love Jack playing Jackie in Virtua Fighter 3. Um, Lion Rafale was my... Uh, Virtual Fighter 2 guy, and then I kind of fell off after 4. Um, 5 is actually pretty good, but I didn't really play it all that much. But yeah, virtual a Virtual Fighter character in my Street Fighter would be awesome, would be a great unexpected crossover, and something that I think makes perfect sense 
for both the end of Street Fighter V and the beginning of what Virtual Fighter has in store. So those are my choices for the fifth character in Street Fighter V Season 5 Pass. You have Adon from Street Fighter Alpha. You have Kenji from Red Earth. You have Chris Redfield from Resident Evil. You have uh, Terry Bogard from SNK. And then one of the Virtual Fighter characters from Sega, Jackie Bryant, obviously being my choice. But we will find out, maybe, on Tuesday during this uh, Street Fighter V spring update. I don't know that we're going to find out for sure, but I would sure like to because uh, the wait has been killing me. And I need to know if I need to jump into this DLC set or consider Street Fighter V done. And finally, we come to the last segment of the show tonight, the Easter-themed segment. I said I was going to do an Easter-themed segment at the top of the show, but it would not be themed in the way that you expect. That when you hear me say Easter-themed, you may be thinking of me listing famous video game bunnies or going on a 10-minute rant about how Bunny Day and Animal Crossing sucks or something like that. No, I am focusing on a different aspect of Easter. And I'm going to talk about five gaming franchises that I would love to resurrect, to bring back from obscurity and dormancy, and bring them into the spotlight of the gaming industry once again, because I think the ground is fertile and good and ready for these games to make a return. The first one is the most obvious. This one, I have been saying, is coming is coming back. I'm not even going to say it should coming back. I think it is coming back. And I've been thinking it since E3 of 2019. The game needs no introduction. Uh, technically, I've already mentioned this franchise earlier in this podcast. And it is easily identifiable by this sound. Uh-huh. That's right. Banjo-Kazooie should be back in our gaming lives. Crash Bandicoot is a perfect example of remastering all the games, getting people reacclimated with them, and then bringing out a brand new one. One through three in the Insane Trilogy were great. Four, It's About Time, is also very good, as my understanding. I do have to pick that game up still. But the, the, gra- the ground is there. The foundation is there. And it's time for Banjo-Kazooie to come back uh, and... and give us another 3D platforming adventure like the ones on the Nintendo 64. We don't talk about nuts and bolts. Um, Now with all of the studios that Xbox has brought in, there are plenty of options for someone to develop a you know, fun and light 3D platformer, put Banjo against Gruntilda again, captured his sister so she can be beautiful, whatever you want to make the story. You keep the weird way that they talk. It makes me laugh every single time. And we just have a lot of fun with Banjo and Kazooie. I would love that. And maybe he's fresh on my mind because I just got the Amiibo last week. Um, the Banjo-Kazooie Amiibo, and it looks amazing. But honestly, I would like to play more Banjo and Kazooie. I would not hate that at all. And I don't think I'm alone in that regard. So, yes, let's do more Banjo-Kazooie, please. Number two is a RPG franchise from Konami. Now, honestly, I could say any of Konami's franchises because they haven't put out a original video game outside of Contra, which we don't talk about on the Switch, and uh, the Pro Evolution Soccer series since they started focusing on pachinko machines in the middle of the 2010s. This one here I'm talking about is Suikoden. Suikoden. Suikoden is a RPG, a uh, Japanese RPG style game, not unlike Final Fantasies or more recently Bravely Default. Um, but the hook of this game was that every game had 108 different heroes that you could enlist and fight with throughout the course of the game. Some of them were optional, some of them were required. Finding all 108 was usually considered to be a big feat in a game like that. Um, the stories were always very good. The DS version, Tear Christ, is excellent. That is one I highly recommend that you look into if you have a DS lying around. In fact, I may try and rebuy that. I don't know what happened to my copy, but I would love to get that back and play that again. The game was so good. I have a 3DS laying around here somewhere. But that awesome, absolutely sweet it in, uh, deserves another shot. Now, there is a spiritual successor coming out. A game called... Ayuden Chronicle, which was on uh, Kickstarter back in July, 
uh, is being made by some of the key creators of that game, Suikoden. And it looks like the uh, Kickstarter for this game really did well. So that game will be coming soon. Let's see how this goes. If this goes well, we won't need another Suikoden in our lives. But if Konami wanted to make a major return to the gaming world and give us that new Suikoden, we would absolutely love it. And I know I don't want it on a pachinko machine. So please don't do that. Um, as of March 23rd, so last week, 46,000 backers pledged 481 million yen to bring this game to fruition i think it was funded i don't know about you but i think it was funded so let's see what ayuden chronicle can do but until then more sweet could end in my life please the third one's a little weird and if you listen to my show with sean brace you did hear me talk about this and i'll go into a little more depth here right now but if you've ever been to a Dave & Buster's or an arcade, one of those big-time arcades where you can, there's machines everywhere, mostly crane games, stuff like that, you may have seen a horse racing arcade game by the name of Derby Owners Club World Edition. Derby Owners Club did come out for the Dreamcast in 1999, but the World Edition came out in the arcades. And what you would do is you would race horses, you would first um, create a horse, you would train it throughout one of many different ways, you would give it food, uh, different options, built different stats, and then you would race it in an upcoming race. There was a schedule of races that would happen. It would be like three or four small races, then a major, and then you would go back through the cycle again. There were like 16 different majors in this arcade game. Um, there were uh, different prizes that you could win, uh, different uh, am- amount of money prizes that you could win for your horse, and eventually, after 20 races or so, you could retire your horse uh, and then breed it to create another horse and keep going and going. These arcade games gave you little cards, little magnetic cards that stored the data with your horses on them. And you could just put them in any Derby Owners Club World Edition machine that you found. And then you could keep your horse going for as long as you wanted to. This was a huge draw for me and my friends and even some of my family members uh, in the days of our youth going to the Wildwood Boardwalk and Gateway 26 on 26th Street in North Wildwood uh, had a machine, and we absolutely loved it. We played it all the time. I had horses. I had a horse named Hoof Hearted because, of course, of course you have a horse named Hoof Hearted if you're playing a horse racing game. It needs to be the first horse you ever name in any horse racing video game, Hoof Hearted. That's H-O-O-F-H-E-A-R-T-E-D, Hoof Hearted. Um, and all kinds of different horses. And I would really like to see that as a digital download on the new consoles. Obviously, you're not going to need cards anymore. They can save their horses to their hard drives. But I feel like this could be a really fun online game. It's probably cheap to make. The game came out in 1999. Put some online components in there. Let us build some horses and race. I think it's a great idea. And I've been saying this for years. I don't know why they don't do it. I haven't seen the machine in Dave Busters anymore. I don't know what they're doing with this franchise. But a new Derby Owners Club from Sega would be so cool. An online-capable Derby Owners Club where we could race for people around the world, build our horses up, retire them, and breed new ones. be so cool. Why don't we do that? Get on that, Sega. I would appreciate it. The fourth one on my list is the only one from Nintendo, which is surprising because Nintendo has a decent amount of franchises that they haven't done anything with in a while. But this one in particular is one that people have been clamoring for and clamoring for for so long, and uh, there has been zero indication that it's going to happen. So, F-Zero, if you could please bring your speed yourself back into our homes, that would be great. F-Zero is a racing franchise from Nintendo, but instead of focusing on go-karts and Mario characters, just focused on crazy speed and over-the-top anime tropes. Captain Falcon from Super Smash Bros. Uh, was a pilot in this game. Uh, there were multiple games on uh, Super Nintendo, and Game Boy Advance, and um, the GameCube. But then it fell out of uh, favor, fell out of obscurity. It, it's not there anymore. Uh, there's there, There's been an arcade F-Zero game, like where the Mario Kart GP, again at Dave & Buster's, but nothing on a home console since the GameCube. And I think we're long overdue. I think we're long overdue for a nice F-Zero game, a crazy speedster sort of uh, 
racing game. I think it would be a huge hit, especially on the Switch where you could have each of the Joy-Cons in your hand and one side here is the regular throttle and then the other side is the boost and then you press the button to activate both at the same time for a super boost and you're, as you're sitting in your chair. It could be really cool. Um, I'm hoping Nintendo gets off their butts on that one. It brings back F-Zero, but let's face it. Right now, they're killing their most popular characters. Uh, so I don't know what they're going to do with their obscure franchises at the moment. And then finally, this is a long shot. This one is one that I just really, really want. Um, I don't know that it's ever going to happen again, at least not from the company that made it, because that company is now busy with other things. I miss Jade Empire. For those who didn't play Jade Empire, that was a Xbox... Uh, original Xbox RPG from Bioware. One of the classic Bioware RPGs before they were bought by EA. It was an Eastern setting set in a... I don't, I don't think it was China or... I don't think it was an actual country, but it was set in that sort of like Kung Fu era. Uh, and the choices that you made kind of lent into the style of fighting that you used. If you were... If you're a Mass Effect fan, if you were a Paragon and made good choices and helped people and things like that, you were the way of the open palm. But if you were a renegade or you were a jerk or you were like a, a, a murderous whatever have you bad guy, you were the way of the closed fist. Um, it's an excellent story uh, with, a, with a nice twist at the end of it um, and a game that is just near and dear to my heart as it was the first ever Bioware game I had ever played. I know I didn't play Knights of the Old Republic. I know, so sue me, string me up, whatever you want to do. Uh, but Jade Empire was my first entry into Bioware, and without Jade Empire, I wouldn't be the Mass Effect fan that I am today. Um, and I would really like to see that franchise get its due. Now, the reason I think it's a long shot is because Bioware is working on Dragon Age 4. They have the Mass Effect Legendary Edition coming out next month. They've already said that the, few, the next game in the Mass Effect series is coming out based on the teaser from the Game Awards 2020. So I just don't see it. I don't see a Jade Empire for a long time, unless one of the other EA studios is going to try it, which would be cool, because now that EA owns Bioware, they own all the IPs. But um, right now, that's my biggest long shot on this list, is Jade Empire. Please bring back Jade Empire. I would be very, very grateful if you did. Uh, so there they are. Those are my five franchises. I, w I would love the video game industry to resurrect, to bring back to our living rooms uh, or basements or wherever you play your video games on the go if you're playing Switch. Uh, I think all five of them have a place. All five of them could be successful, and all five of them could be a big, big boon to our gaming experiences. So if the any of the owners of these franchises are listening to me uh, or, or, or happen to stumble across this podcast and you have a say in bringing these games back, please do it because we will play them. And I know that I'm not alone when I say that. And that brings us to the end of episode number 42 of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast presented by Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM, 1480 AM, iHeartRadio. My name is eSports and Gaming Insider Jason Finelli, and I am always, always grateful that you spend some time with me every single week talking about video games and eSports. I hope you learned something today. I hope you were entertained today, and I hope that you come back again next week for episode 43, where I can entertain you and educate you on all things video games and esports some more. Until that time, this is Jason signing off. Thank you, as always, for listening. Good night.